All right, everybody, it's time to get started. Good afternoon, folks. Welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. I'm your host, Chris Smith, and I work here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. The Lunchtime Discovery Series is a broadcast service of us here at the museum in downtown Raleigh, but the series is organized and put on by the folks at the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality. Many thanks to them for helping us bring this program to you every single week. It's a great partnership. It's good to be with you all. Welcome to our YouTube and Facebook uh, Lunchtime Discovery Series programs. We're here every Wednesday at noon, bringing you exciting stuff happening in the world of science and nature and art and education every week right here. Uh, I say every week. For the month of November, we'll actually just be here for these first three Wednesdays. The last Wednesday of the month, no show. It's right before the Thanksgiving holiday, so we're going to go ahead and pass on that one. But then we'll be right back here in your feeds again in December. So hope that you are tuned in, plugged in. You've got calendar reminders set for every Wednesday to come back and join us. If this is your first time or your, I don't know, intimate time, joining the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Jump into the chat, whether you're watching on YouTube or the comments on Facebook. Say hi, let us know you're watching from. We always like to see our friends hanging out in the chat. Of course, as the presentation goes through, you can also leave your questions for our guest speakers there as well. At the end of the presentations, the program becomes interactive. I wanna know your thoughts and your questions for our guest. So as we're going through, drop those into the chat at the end. I'll turn there in order to get your questions and moderate them for the remainder of the program. That'll be coming up a little later in the show. But for now, let's get to the cool science and fun part of the program where we all get to learn new things and meet interesting people. Today's interesting person, very interesting person, is Dr. Carly York. Dr. York is a biology professor at Lenore Rhine University and a science communicator. Carly, welcome to the show. Hello, it's great to be here. Thanks for joining us today for the program. Uh, it's not often, actually, that we really dive into a lot of wildlife that maybe kind of sort of doesn't live in North Carolina, like uh, like squid. Yeah, um, well, they're off the coast of North Carolina, so even if they're not in it, they're close by. Um, I'm also going to sneak in a different organism as well that is also in North Carolina. So hold on to your pants. There's more than squid that you're gonna hear about today. Um, should I go ahead and share my screen? I say, let's do it. Let's jump in. All right. And folks keep the uh, keep the squid game puns to, to a minimum for me. <laughs> as a joke. Can, or do your worst. I'm not sure. Or do your worst. <laughs> <laughs> One or the other. Um, all right, well, I'm gonna to talk to you at least at first about squid today, and particularly the sensory world of squid. Um, I studied squid for my PhD. I love squid. I'm really excited to share what I know with you today. So our squid belong to a group of animals called the cephalopods. And the cephalopods include not only the squid, but also cuttlefish, the octopus, and the Nautilus. And these animals have been around in the evolutionary record for around 500 million years. So back, back in the Cambrian era, um, they clearly have a really robust natural history. They're clearly very good at surviving, um, being around for this amount of time. And squid themselves are really good predators, but they also have a lot of animals that prey upon them. So seals and sea lions are gonna eat squid. Marine birds eat squid. Our whales, dolphins eat squid. Even humans eat squid. Um, in addition to that, fish are gonna eat squid. Squid are going to eat other squid. So they have a ton of different predators that are coming at them from all different directions. So in order to have been so successful in the evolutionary history, we know that these animals have to have some pretty fantastic anti-predator behaviors. And I was really interested in looking at squid throughout their entire lives. So how does a baby squid respond to a predator? 
And how does an adult squid respond to a predator? Now, a baby squid is technically called a paralarvae. And the reason it gets this special term of paralarvae is because there are some major differences when they're baby squid and when they are adult squid, but they don't undergo a full metamorphosis like a butterfly, the butterfly does. Um, but it's enough to not just say that it is a larval form. So our baby squid hatch out very, very, very tiny. So the species I worked with was around 0.18 centimeters in the mantle length, which is the body. Um, you don't measure the arms because they can pull those in or put them out and get some very different measurements. Um, the adult squid that I worked with were still pretty small in terms of squid sizes, but four to eight centimeters considerably larger than the paralarval squid. Um, so they have these size differences. They also have some ecological differences as well. Our paralarvae are so tiny that they're basically just planktonic. They're going to be at the mercy of our ocean's currents, but our adult squid are really strong swimmers. Many of them undergo pretty long distance migrations. Now in the ways that they actually respond to a predator, we have a few different sensory modalities that they are using to navigate their environment. Um, the first one is vision. So squid have these really, really big, well-developed eyes. Um, squid have camera eyes and cephalopods are the only invertebrate group of animals that have evolved the camera eye. So it is functionally very, very, very similar to a vertebrate eye. It has all of the major components that the vertebrate eye has as well. Um, it even has one step up on the vertebrate eye because the optic, no low, um, the optic nerve intersects with the eyeball in a way that doesn't create a blind spot. Where we have a blind spot, they actually don't. So they also have these really big optic lobes in their brain that help them to integrate the sensory information. So clearly vision is really, really important for these animals, no question about that. But they also have a lesser known sensory modality that I thought they might be using as well. Um, it's called the lateral line analog. And if you're familiar with fish, you might be familiar with the lateral line structure. Um, it literally runs laterally alongside the body of the animal. And it consists of thousands and thousands of tiny little sensory hair cells. And each of these hair cells are individually innervated and it allows them to feel the flow of water around their body. So squid have an analogous system, which is why it's called the lateral line analog. They weren't particularly creative when they named the squid system. Um, in fact, it's a little bit clunky and problematic this term because the lateral line analog on squid is not lateral on the animal's body at all. In fact, it runs over the head and the arms of the animal. So um, not lateral, but it's a similar system and it's Still thousands of little hair cells, each individually innervated, that are capable of feeling the flow of water around them. So we know that squid have this system. There was some work that was done in the 80s that just said, yeah, they have this system. It's clearly helping them to feel the flow of water around their bodies. Um, but we don't know how they're using it ecologically. So I was really interested in zooming in on this sensory modality and seeing how this was going to help them in avoiding predators. So my research really boiled down to two major questions here. How do squid detect a threat? And how do they avoid being eaten? So to answer these questions, I had to go find some squid. So I ended up using two different species in order to answer my questions about how this goes throughout the entire lifespan of a squid. Um, I used a species called Dortuthus pilii for my paralarvae, and I acquired them. I ordered eggs through marine biological labs. They sent them to me in a plastic bag and I hatched them out in my lab. Um, 
And for my older squid, my juveniles and adults, I went trawling off of the eastern shore of Virginia and caught squid, brought them back into the lab to run my experiments. Um, Ideally, I would have loved to have used the same species throughout my entire experiments, Um, but squid are tricky. They're very elusive creatures, and we don't actually know where Lalagunkula brevis lays their eggs. We don't know where they go to do that. They, they clearly do, and they come back to the same area every year, but we don't know about that phase of their life. Um, Dortuthus pelei is really, really similar to Lalagunkula, both ecologically and morphologically, but their range starts from like Delaware up north, whereas Lalagunkula is like Maryland down through the Gulf. Um, so I wasn't able to trawl for adults. Um, so this was the best I could do given those constraints, but they're pretty similar ecologically, morphologically, still good animals to ask these questions on. So with my major question being about the lateral line system and how it plays a role in predator evasion, I had to figure out a way to remove that lateral line system and see how well they did with avoiding predators. Um, And this is something that has been done in other organisms. It's commonly done in fish. It had never been done in a squid before or any other invertebrate. But the way that they do this in fish is they actually soak the animal in an antibiotic solution. And it sounds weird. It is weird. It causes apoptosis of those hair cells. We're not really sure of the mechanism either, but it's also commonly used in hearing research to ablate hair, uh, hair cells within the inner ear. Um, so not sure why it works, but it does. So these are some scan electron microscopy photos that I took um, before and after the treatment. Uh, the photo on the left is uh, my control group. So you can see that those hair cells are abundant, they're nice and healthy. And then over on the right was after they had been soaked in a 500 micromolar neomyosin solution. So you can see there are far less of them. What is left is pretty porous and damaged. So we were like, cool, this seems to work on squid as well. Um, Additionally, we, watched them for a while to see if their behavior shifted at all after being exposed to the neomycin. Um, Squid are super sensitive. They're hard to keep in captivity under perfect conditions. So we were concerned that exposing them to these chemicals could be detrimental, but luckily um, they were fine. They continued to eat. They continued to swim. They lived a few weeks after treatment, which is about all we can ask for from a squid being kept in captivity. And my experiments roughly looked a little something like this, where I had a 500 gallon seawater tank and I had two predators and I used flounder as predators for my adults. I used some little mommy chugs for my predators in the paralarval tank. Um, Flounders are a natural predator for squid and you wouldn't know by looking at them, but they are ferocious. Um, They got so accustomed to me putting the squid into this tank. There was a time I actually reached my hand over the tank and it jumped out and it bit me and drew blood. Um, so they were, they were very good at their job of catching the squid. So the way these experiments went was I had this basket, put the squid in there, let it hang out for about 10 minutes to acclimate. I pulled that basket up. Our trials would begin when the animals were able to interact and I had a high speed video camera that was recording the entire interactions. So I was looking at escape attempts, survival, and um, able to zoom in on some of the kinematics that were happening within these different scenarios. Um, The little tank up in the right hand corner is representative of the paralarval tank. This was a much, much smaller situation since our baby squid were only point one, eight centimeters large. So a much, much tinier tank, but the same um, methods. And since I was interested in examining the different sensory modalities, I wanted to eliminate them strategically. So I had one trial where they had visual cues, meaning the lights were on and their lateral line was intact. I had one group 
where the lights were on, but that lateral line was ablated. One group where I removed visual cues, and I just did that by turning out all the lights, and I had blackout curtains around the tank. And then one group where both vision and the lateral line were removed. And I did this also within the parallel RV. So what I found was that starting with our adults, um, the adult squid performed an escape jet throughout every single trial when a predator approached them. So it didn't matter if their lateral line was ablated or if they were in the dark, they responded to every single predator attack. Um, it's likely there were some other senses at play here. They can smell, so there's probably some olfactory cues. Um, they might've been getting some auditory cues as well. Um, but every single time the predator approached our adults, they performed an escape jet. Now the paralarvae, they also performed an escape jet whenever a predator was around. But once we removed that lateral line system, their escape responses really, really reduced. So our paralarvae were being affected by that ablation treatment in a way that the juveniles and adults were not. And so we wanted to really look at these interactions and be like, all right, so there's more to this than did they escape or did they not escape? But what did this interaction really look like? And what we found was that in the paralarvae, they had kind of one mode. They had a fixed jet pattern where if a predator was coming and they were going to perform an escape response, they did it at the same velocity, same acceleration, same distance. They just had this one mode of a jet. Um, but our juveniles and adults had some flexibility where they could do these short little jets. They could do one very big jet. They were far more variable in terms of velocity and acceleration and in distance. Um, and that ended up playing a pretty big role when we looked at the bigger picture beyond just are they performing an escape jet? And these differences in jets played a pretty big role when we looked at survivability. Um, it doesn't matter if you jet every time, if you still get eaten. And what we found was that that ablation ended up having a pretty big role in the kinds of jets that the squid decided to do. So looking at this graph, we're looking at the mean proportion of survival of the squid and each of the different treatment groups, the parallel RVR and the white bars, the juveniles and adults are in the gray bars. And if we look at our juveniles and adults, you can see that we have decreased survivability as we start to remove sensory cues. And that's because not all escape jets were created equal. They weren't performing as good a jets for the situation once their lateral line systems were ablated, once we started removing those visual cues. And in the paralarvae, you see that survivability was reduced in those ablated groups, um, particularly in the dark ablated group where we removed both of those sensory cues. So it's clear that both of these are playing a major role in what it takes for a squid to successfully escape an oncoming predator. So overall from this set of experiments, I was able to conclude that this lateral line analog is going to aid vision in helping with a successful predator evasion at all stages. And this is a really neat finding because the lateral line analog of the squid is an example of convergent evolution. Like these two systems, um, the lateral line of the fish versus the squid, they evolved completely independently along with the camera eye. So the squid is just like an alternative universe fish. We have these same sensory structures that have evolved independently with both of these animals that have super similar ecological niches. So it's really neat to find that they're using these sensory modalities in very similar ways. So my next question, my first part was, how do they avoid a predator? This is how with the ladder line. Um, how, do they, how do they prevent being eaten? 
Um, they have some other behaviors aside from just jetting that can help them in this pursuit. Um, so cephalopods are really well known for their ability to camouflage. Um, up top in this slide, you can see an octopus that is nestled into some sea kelp. Uh, this is the time-lapsed photo. So in the first one, he's pretty well hidden. In the middle, you can start to see him sneaking out a little bit. And in the last, he's fully visible. Um, and in the bottom photos, there's a cuttlefish that's blending in really well with some gravel and also trying really, really hard to blend in with that checkerboard pattern there as well. So they're pretty good at being able to camouflage. And the reason they are so good is because of these organs that are in their skin. Um, our cephalopods are able to change color in a very different way than our vertebrate animals. It's not hormonal. It's all through, um, nervous, um, through, through the nervous system. And what you're looking at right now, each of these flashes in front of you is an organ called a chromatophore. And the chromatophores are a sack of, of pigment, of a color. And around that is a ring of muscle. And that muscle can um, contract in order to hide that and expand and in order to show that color. And each one of these has its own nerve. So it can fire in a fraction of a second and it can fire in infinite different kinds of body patterns. So our cephalopods are really, really exceptional in their ability to camouflage because of this system. Our cephalopods can also do an inking response when they feel uh, threatened by a predator. So ink is comprised of mucus, which gives it its viscous shape, um, melanin, which gives it its color. And then there's some other chemicals in there as well, including L-dopa and dopamine. Um, both of these are neurotransmitters. They're feel-good chemicals in us. And we're not entirely sure why they have these chemicals in ink. It could be that um, a confused predator will chomp on that ink, get some feel-good chemicals, and then go on their way. Um, it's also possible that this is a conspecific cue where these chemicals are being picked up by other squid that are telling each other um, there's a predator around. It's, a, it's an alarm system that you should be on the lookout, but we are not sure exactly how they are using that. Um, they can also create a variety of different shapes with this. You can do like a giant smoke screen that they just disappear behind. Um, they can also create ink blobs that are the same shape that they are that act as decoys and they'll make little puffs of them as they swim away for predators to chomp on instead of them. It's also a number of different postures that cephalopods will take on um, to be a little scarier than they are. This is Lollagunkula brevis, and these were the two major postures that it used. It would splay its arms out um, or toss them up over its head, both of which I presume are making it um, feel a little bigger, a little scarier. There are cephalopods that do much more extraordinary behaviors like this. Um, for example, the Indonesian mimic octopus can mimic different animals in its environment. It can pretend to be a sea snake. It can pretend to be a lionfish. Um, clearly has a really good grasp on the ecology that's going on around it and knows the animals that the predators fear. And it takes on the morphs of those different animals. Now, a lot of those behaviors we see in the older squid. The paralarval squid, they have um, a little less sophisticated strategy when it comes to avoiding a predator. Um, and it's things like what you're seeing on the screen right now. Our paralarvae have a suite of stereotype behaviors that they do. And again, remember these are incredibly tiny. So if a very, very small squid is doing behaviors like this, these circling around, they'll change orientation, they'll zigzag left and right, um, it's really hard to track them. Um, another thing that they do is they keep their bodies completely clear. Instead of contracting chromatophores, they stay completely clear. So very small, totally clear bodies, 
zipping all around in unpredictable directions, it ends up being a pretty good anti-predator strategy. And it's sort of the best that they can do at the stage in their life until they get a little bit more nervous system development. So when I looked at this throughout ontogeny, what I found was that truly for these little guys, being clear, being erratic, um, that's the best way to avoid a predator. But our adult squid showed some pretty sophisticated um, behaviors when it came to how the predator was attacking them. Um, they would sit and watch. And if the predator was moving pretty slowly, and if they were at a decent distance away, they would choose to do a posture like the one on the screen. Um, and they might change their coloring to do a stripe pattern like the one, break up its outline a little bit. But it waited until the predator was moving much closer, much faster. And at that point in time, it would show an inking response. And this makes sense because ink is expensive to make. It takes energy. You don't want to just use it all up at every, every little time you get scared. So they wait until it seems like it's a serious threat. And then they're going to use their inking response, which is a clever strategy. So overall, um, my first question was, how do squid detect a threat? They're going to be using this combination of visual cues and the lateral line cues throughout ontogeny in order to avoid being eaten. But then they have these other strategies as well, including changing their color, including postures, including inking, um, in order to really have one other safety measure behind just that escape jet in order to assure their survival. All right, so I lured you here today under the pretense that I was talking about squid and I didn't lie, you've learned a lot about squid. Um, but I also would like to talk a little bit about frogs. Um, that squid research that I just shared with you was from my doctoral research. Um, I have since moved on and now I am a professor at Lenore Ryan University as Chris said. And when I got out here, I realized that um, there's no squid in the mountains of North Carolina. And I had to find a different organism to study. And it just so happened that there was a colony of African clawed frogs here on campus. And when I came, the animal care person was like, we have frogs, do you want frogs? No one's doing anything. And I was like, Sure, I don't have any better idea of what to do, so I'll take the frogs. Um, but it turns out they're actually a really neat species in order to keep working on my sensory physiology research. Um, so the African clawed frog, or Xenopus, is a pretty unique frog. Um, it undergoes a full metamorphosis similar to other species, but, um, but they actually remain an aquatic frog throughout their entire lifetime. So they have some unique adaptations to help them with this. You can see in this picture here that he is webbing between his toes. You can also see the little black dots at the end of his toes. Um, they're called African clawed frogs because they have claws, which is unique for an amphibian. Um, they also do not have tongues which is of course unique for our amphibians. We're used to seeing them extend that tongue catching insects. Um, instead, what these animals do is they use their hands and they actually push food into their mouths with their hands in a pretty spastic, erratic kind of a fashion. It's pretty fun to watch them eat. Um, they also too can change their color a little bit. It's not nearly as extraordinary as the squid, I'm always gonna be biased towards the squid, but they do it in a much slower fashion. It's through a hormonal pathway, so they can't do it as quickly. Um, and it's really just shades of brown, but they can blend a little bit into their background with these different shades of brown. And you might be familiar with Xenopus because it is a really common biomedical model animal. Um, 
it's incredibly hardy. It's easy to keep in labs. They live for like 15 to 20 years. And for that reason, it's been used in a lot of different laboratory settings. It was one of the first vertebrates that was cloned. It's been sent into space. Um, but it's probably biggest claim to fame is that it was one of the first widely available pregnancy tests. Um, turns out through a weird story of happenstance that these frogs are really sensitive to um, chorionic gonadotropin hormone, um, HCG, which is the hormone that is detected in women's urine when they are pregnant. And the way that this all was found out, there was a researcher who was studying how they actually changed their color a little bit. And he thought it was in the pituitary. He removed the pituitary. He was right. They couldn't change color. They also had some weird side effects. He injected them with this hormone, hoping it might solve some of the problems. And what he found was that the females within a few hours were laying eggs. And Prior to this, the only pregnancy tests were um, using rabbits and rats. It required a long period of time. It required dissection um, and it was really uncommonly used. And um, Hogbin was the name of the researcher who first found this out. He realized that there was a market for this and the frogs would lay eggs within like 10 hours of being injected with the urine. Um, they were incredibly reliable and you could do it like once a week with them and they would just keep living. There was no need for dissection. You could just keep injecting them and they would keep um, spitting out eggs if they were exposed to that hormone. So these were the most widely uh, used pregnancy tests from the 1930s up until the 1960s. Um, and that means that hospitals and labs all over the world were keeping an abundance of these animals. And it turns out these animals are really good at escaping their enclosures. Um, I can vouch for this. I've had a few frogs that have disappeared on me. Those hind legs are surprisingly powerful at getting out of tanks. Um, and now they're invasive species all around the world. Um, combination of escapees, a combination of being released in places that they shouldn't be. Uh, this is a map of the United States and all of the places that are in red are where there is an invasive Xenopus colony now. So you can see that Florida and California are pretty bad. We do actually have some invasive populations that have popped up in North Carolina as well. Um, this map is a little outdated, it's 2018. I think they've grown a little bit since then. Um, so invasive species are always bad. We don't know what that is going to do to the ecology um, where these animals have been released. Um, this is particularly bad because we think that the release of Xenopus has widely contributed to the spread of chytrid fungus, which is a fungus that gets into the skin of our amphibians and is one of the leading causes of population decline in our amphibians. Um, it spreads really, really rapidly. And Xenopus have a protective mucus layer all over their body and they don't get chytrid fungus. The thought is that they were probably exposed to this in their native African habitats and um, brought it with them and then was were released. So it's an invasive problem in all the normal ways, but it's a bigger one in terms of this chytrid fungus getting into our environment as well. So um, I'm a, still a sensory physiologist and I uh, really wanted to apply what I had done with the squid in terms of looking at the frogs and chipping away at some basic science questions as to how these animals could be affecting the ecosystems that they've now been placed within. So instead of looking at what is eating the frogs and how that could um how their sensory modalities play a role there. I'm interested in looking at what the frogs are eating and how their sensory modalities are helping them to identify prey. And these animals will eat anything. They'll cannibalize each other. They eat fish. Um, this little guy down here has a face full of blood worms, I think. They're really not picky. So the potential for them to do a lot of damage is, is there. Um, and 
this is work that I've been doing with some undergraduate students. Uh, Maggie Keller is up here. She's actually going to be presenting some of this research at a conference this weekend. Um, just in doing some really basic assessment of looking at how these animals eat, we compared their behaviors between um, when there was a live fish in their tank versus just some pelleted food. And what we found was that with the pelleted food, they were doing a lot more seeking behaviors, meaning they were like using their hands to kind of sweep things towards them. They were clearly trying to figure out where the food source was uh, versus a live fish where they didn't perform any of those behaviors. They seemed to know where the fish was. Um, and then in this graph down below, looking at the strike velocity, comparing between our live fish and our pelleted food, they striked at a live fish a whole lot faster than a pelleted food. So less seeking behavior, a faster strike, it was really indicating that they seem to be using something about the movement of the fish in order to, um, to track it, to catch it. And because Xenopus is a fully aquatic species, it actually maintains its lateral line system throughout its entire life. Most other amphibians lose it. And um, in this case, we do call it a lateral line. It's not a lateral line analog, since this is directly related to the fish, to the vertebrate line of the sensory system. So we're really interested in investigating how the lateral line system of our Xenopus could potentially be um, playing a role in prey acquisition. They have eyes that sit really on the top of their head. Um, and it looks as though those eyes are more used for detecting a predator that could be aerial than for finding the food itself. Um, so that other sort of interesting feature leads us to think that this lateral line system could be playing a major role here. So we're doing a really similar system uh, setup to what I did with the squid. We're using an antibiotic and we're ablating that lateral line system. Um, this, this ablation is just a little bit different than what we did with the squid, but it's the same kind of a technique. And we're doing a similar experimental design where we're gonna be testing in lights, non-ablated, dark, non-ablated, light ablated, and dark ablated conditions. And we're going to be investigating how um, the frogs respond when pr presented with a live fish. Um, so we're now at the analysis part of this. I don't have results to share with you right now, but what we're going to be looking at are things like velocity of the attack, angle of attack, um, successful versus unsuccessful attacks and attack attempts to try to isolate out that lateral line system and see how it could be playing a role here. Um, so overall, what we hope to learn from this is um, how do these different sensory modalities help them to choose their diet? And this is a really basic science question, but we hope that the information can potentially lead to some conservation efforts in this area. So with that, I am very happy to answer questions. Um, both about squid and the best I can about the frogs. Um, I've had a lot of people who were involved in both corners of these this research. Um, I also do have a TED Ed video on all of basically all of my dissertation research on the squid combined into five minutes and animated. I highly recommend you check that out. Um, I also have one on the frogs on the way that should be out. I'm not even sure, in the next few months, hopefully. So keep an eye out for that as well. Um, but yes, I'm happy to answer questions. Carly, thank you so much. Yeah. Everybody, let's give Dr. York a great big round of applause. You can drop like clapping hands emojis into the chat box <laughs> for uh, awesome stuff. I did not know that squid could I guess, eject ink in specific shapes, yeah. including mirroring the shape of their own body in order to escape. I had always just thought, just make a cloud and then swim away as fast as you can. No, there's That's a, fascinating. A different shapes. Yeah, when it's the size of the animal itself, we call it a pseudomorph. Um, but there's also like, oh, I forget what we called it. There's little cloud poofs. They, these ha they have actual names. I can't remember all of them. There's like the puffs versus the cloud versus the screen and the pseudomorph. 
yeah, all kinds of shapes. Cool. That's that's fascinating to me. Okay, well, hey folks, uh, drop your thoughts and questions into the chat and into the comments because that's where I'm headed right now. So the first one that I see here that came up during the presentation, uh, Marianne wanted to know if you can put trackers on squid to see where they go. You can. Um, there's a lab up at Woods Hole who is working on this with much bigger squid than um, my species. Um, I am not 100% sure how they do that. It's tricky because their skin is so delicate. Um, Okay. But they do. <laughs> there are there are people who are doing this. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking a little five centimeter uh, squid's probably not going <laughs> to hold on to an RFID chip, or certainly not a satellite tag. But maybe yeah. some of these really big ones. Yeah. All right. Let's see here. The next one comes from Will. Hi, Will. Thanks for watching today. Uh, can squids see in infrared or ultraviolet? They cannot. Um, squid are actually colorblind and they can really only see into, um, oh, I forget the actual number. It's around like 580 or something. So we're talking like blue green is the only spectrum that our squid can see. There's a few exceptions to this. There's the firefly squid that actually has tricolor vision like we do. But other than that, they're colorblind which makes the color changing extra extraordinary. So, so squid are colorblind. They see, you said they do see blue green. Yeah. But Is that an evolutionary advantage for being underwater? Probably. Um, you know, we, we end up having a lot of the visible light frequencies filtered out by water. Um, mm -hmm. So there's not much of a need to see beyond that. It's just surprising given how, how colorful they can be that they don't see um, beyond that single um, visual spectrum. Oh, okay. This is right. So wait, well, then how does a chromatophore know to be red or, or blue or green or brown or to try to be checkerboarded? It, um, it comes down a lot to contrast. So they can see contrast really well. They can see polarized light, which is any light that has been reflected off of a surface. So they can use that polarized light too in order to figure out patterning. Um, okay. Yeah, so it really comes down to the contrast more than anything. If that checkerboard had been like shades of gray, it would have been really tough for them to have done that because it was black and white. They were able to figure it out in a way they couldn't. Um, and in terms of like the chromatophores, each one, they actually change color as they age. They're going to get, um, is it darker or lighter? I, for, I forget which direction it goes, probably lighter. Um, but they start black and they end up going to like a yellow phase throughout their life. So the age of a chromatophore organ is going to dictate the actual color of it. Oh, interesting. They get gray like I do. <laughs> All right, let's see. Uh, next one here is from Glenn. Do any other cephalopods have a lateral line analog? They do. Um, the cuttlefish have it as well. Um, some octopus species do too. Um, there's been very, very little work done on this system in general, there's a lot more questions to be asked about how it's used ecologically for sure. Okay, all right, interesting, interesting. Uh, let's see, Will's got another one for you. What is your favorite thing about what you do? <laughs> and then what's the worst? Oh man. <sighs> You know, I, um, I got into my field because I love animals and I love being able to talk about animals every day. I found that I love the people that I get to talk about to, to, to the, that I get to talk about animals to, um, I enjoy them more than I ever expected to when I got into this field. Um, I really love teaching and I particularly love teaching 
people who are not in science fields. So I really enjoy the field of science communication and talking to people who um, aren't, aren't scientists themselves. Maybe they're fearful of science um, or felt like they didn't belong in science and trying to create a more welcoming space for them. Um, my least favorite part of what I do is probably the two hour faculty meeting that I have to sit through this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> I wonder, maybe the president of Lenore Ryan is watching, but I'm not sure. Oh, uh, and he'll say, please excuse <laughs> Carly from this meeting. She clearly doesn't want to be here. And I'll say, thank you. <laughs> I don't. Let's, <laughs> let's hope so. Let's hope so. <laughs> Okay, uh, let me see here. We've got more questions for you. Uh, we've got a student watching, who a middle school, I think middle school student watching. What is the most dangerous type of squid? Oh, um, well, you probably want to think it's the giant squid, but um, they're very, very big, but they're not very dangerous because we never see them. They're deep sea animals and um, we've barely ever, we've seen just a little bit of footage of one that was alive, but barely alive. Um, there is a species of squid that's off of the coast of California called the Humboldt squid. And they're, they kind of, they look like your typical, like what you picture when you see a squid, but they can be like four feet, three, four feet in length. Um, so they're just like giant muscles and along their arms, they have hooks in their arms and they're really aggressive. And when they get mad, they flash red at you. Um, so they've been known to cannibalize each other. They've also been known to try and attack divers and to take masks off of divers. So, um, I don't know if they're the most dangerous, but they certainly sound very scary. I have never had the pleasure of meeting one, though. All right. Well, uh, students, I think it's the Governor Moorhead School. Uh, don't go messing with Humboldt squid. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. I'm going to say you should probably be really nice to all the squid just to be safe. Mm -hmm. If there are some that have hooks in their arms uh, and... And did you say we'll rip, try to take the face mask off of a diver? Yeah. Yeah. They've so they're also, divers. yeah, they, they know what's going on there too. Hmm. They sound smarter than us. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> All right. Pam, you're very welcome. That was great questions. Great questions from your students. Um, so are there other wildlife or other animals that you think this kind of sensory physiology work you'll be able to do in others? Like you've done lateral line analogs in squid and now you've got lateral lines in frogs and we know there are other fish that use similar systems. Yeah. So is, is there another animal that you're like, you know what, I want to investigate that sensory system. You know, if I could have any critter that I could just start to do this kind of research with, it would probably be with sea slugs, um, the nudibranch sea slugs. Um, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, you should go to Google image and look up sea slug or nudibranch is what they're called. N U D nude N U D I brink. I shouldn't have tried to do that. Uh, but they're beautiful. They're, they're really stunning. And they're relatives of the squid. They all are mollusks. I don't know what their sensory physiology is like, but I think they're beautiful and I would love to know more about them. Um, I started off as a scientist studying vertebrates. So my, my master's degree was looking at horses and um, their stress physiology and their behavior um, so going from that to squid was a huge deviation in what I had ever pictured for myself to begin with. But once you've stepped foot into the world of invertebrates, um, 
they're amazing. They're so amazing. And there's so much that we don't know too, that I'd love to spend a little bit more time studying them. There you go. Excellent stuff. Uh, well, Carly, again, thank you so much for being here today. You're welcome. This is fun. Excellent presentation. It was great to learn about squid. Uh, great to learn about this uh, frog work that you've got going on right now. Uh, if folks want to keep up with the frog research and future projects, uh, is there a way for them to do that? Sure. Um, I am active on Twitter at Biology Carly. Um, I post pretty regularly there and I will continue to share what's up with my research. There you go, folks. Give Biology Carly a follow on Twitter if you're active there. And hey, uh, if you're hanging out on Twitter while you're there, you could also follow the Office of Environmental Education. They're at North Carolina EE. And of course, you can follow the Museum of Natural Sciences. We're at Natural Sciences on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We try to make it easy for you. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. We will be back here next Wednesday at noon with another program. We're going to be talking to Dr. Carol Price from the North Carolina Aquariums and a couple of students from NC State about work on the crystal skipper butterfly right on the North Carolina coast. So exciting stuff coming up next week as well. And I hope that we'll see you again then. Carly, again, thanks from me, from the museum, and from the Office of Environmental Education for being here. And folks, like we always say, take care, stay safe, keep your community safe. We'll see you again next time. Bye, everybody. <laughs>